Uh, just a few words of introduction. This is me um, in a, with a different haircut, but anyway. I have a background in education, in learning psychology, instructional design, and I also have a master on, in cognitive science, which is kind of a, a crossover between psychology and computer science. Uh, and that's maybe why I ended up in online and blended learning quite a lot. When I arrived to Maastricht University 15 years ago, I coordinated a, a, a group that worked on instructional design and e-learning for a bit. Uh, and I'll be drawing a, on those experiences today as well, um, because we're talking about student-centered learning in online and blended learning today. Just a little bit of background of where I am. Um, I work at Maastricht University at the School of Health Professions Education, um, where we do research on health professions education. We offer a number of courses and programs and we collaborate in uh, projects with partners. Um, the courses and programs that we order from that that we arrange from the school of health professions education are all postgraduate programs focusing on people who work in healthcare professions and then go into teaching or coordinating full programs um, and i'll be using some of those examples but we also teach in our regular bachelor and master programs and one of the tasks that we have is also to support teachers in medicine, health science, biomedical science, uh, biomedical sciences or, or public health, uh, to support them if they want to change or innovate their program. So I'll be using a few of those examples as well. We're talking about online and blended um, education today and online learning has kind of changed our teaching world and some people would claim that it's a, a very big change in education. Now, I'm old enough to remember that we said the same thing about video in the 80s and the internet in the 90s. Uh, and I think we're already seeing some new trends evolving. So I don't think I would go this far, but online learning certainly has changed uh, the way that we teach. Um, but often online learning of our online education looks like this. A recorded lecturer um, giving a lecture on in quite the same way as you would do on site. And in my perception as an educationalist, that's not really innovative. It's using technology, but not in a new way. Actually, it's going against the way that we think a learning should work. At Maastricht University, all our programs are based on problem-based learning, which looks distinctively different as uh, small groups, students talking to each other, and we strongly believe in principles of student-centered learning. We think that learning is a constructive, contextual, collaborative, self-directed process, and most of you have seen those terms passing by a lot last week, I think. So this is where we started out from. How do we do that uh, when students are always online or a lot of the time uh, online and not present? I'll try to use some examples, um, but I'm already giving you a spoiler alert uh, because one size doesn't fit all. And I hope to show you by these examples that the solution for this isn't always the same. Starting with the first example that I think many of us have experienced. During COVID, during lockdown, all our problem-based learning sessions had to go online. All our bachelor and master programs did synchronous online PBL sessions in much the same way as they would do them on site. Now, the students were usually young students who were living in Maastricht. Sometimes they went back to their parents because during lockdown there was nothing to do. Um, they used online materials. Um, the lectures were recorded. Uh, They're always recorded, uh, even though normally students can go. And the PBL sessions were moved online. And we also did exams online. Very briefly, some of our experiences. 
well, first of all, there was no other option. So people were kind of glad that there was an option to continue education. And because it was a large crisis, there was a lot of investment in technology and support. So that was okay. What also worked for us was to kind of keep it simple and stick to the same plans that we had for on-site education. So even the time schedules stay the same as they, they would have been otherwise. But there are also some challenges. We saw that online PBL requires large commitment from staff and students, and that wasn't always there. So students weren't um, always very active, for example. There were challenges of online communication, especially when people switch to the screen, people doing anything. Uh, but most of all, people really missed the social contact um, in those days. If I go back to those principles of student-centered learning, you could say that online synchronous PBL sessions like this are more or less constructive, contextual, collaborative, and self-directed learning in the same way as on-site, except that maybe as a tutor, you have less insight in what students are actually doing, how active they are, and some students get lost. And so you kind of draw more on their self-directed learning skills, and when they don't have them, they, they might get lost. It was a little bit different when 10 years ago, we did something similar for one of the master programs that offered a part-time option. And it's a master's of healthcare innovation that you could do full-time or part-time. And the part-time students were usually working healthcare professionals um, that didn't live in Maastricht. They were from the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany. So it was an international group, but they were not very far from Maastricht. They were within a circle of 400, 500 kilometers from Maastricht. And these students, um, they came to Maastricht about once every two months, so they could do their exams on site and they could also start up a new course on site. Um, and in a similar way, they had their online materials, recorded lectures, um, and then online synchronous PBL sessions on Fridays. And we did adjust a little bit. We made the groups a little bit smaller. We also made the sessions a little bit shorter um, because speaking for two hours online is quite long. In that group, we also did some research and we, we, we saw and, and researched, saw in our research that the discussions in those synchronous online PBL sessions were at least as much in depth as the discussions that students had uh, in the full time masters on site. Now, there were a couple of reasons why it worked very well in this instance, we think, uh, and we also know from the evaluations. The most important one was that there was an immediate gain for these part time students. Uh, instead of having to travel to Maastricht every Friday, they could travel to Maastricht every two months or so, and that saved a lot of time. They were also highly motivated students and students with work experience, so they had actually uh, a motivation to learn what they were learning. They told us, though, that it made a lot of difference that they did know each other beforehand, that there were some on-site meetings that now and again, every two months or so, they did see each other and they, they, they knew each other beforehand. And we also tried to offer some social activities during those days. And the students told us that's really important. That really helps for us to feel that we have a safe space, that we are a group of people that, that want to engage in this together. Challenges there. We still struggled a bit with technology because for us that was the first time that we're, we were doing this online and we also uncovered then or we also saw that there are some rules for interaction and online communication right so you have to be more specific about taking turns uh, for example you can't all talk at the same time because then nobody hears. Look at this example i'm i'm quite confident to say that this was 
a good way to do student-centered learning in those conditions uh, for these kind of students and with those conditions. I'll talk a little bit more now about examples that are less similar to traditional problem-based learning. Uh, and the first one is our master program, our Master of Health Professions Education that we run, which is a, a part-time program. It's mostly online. Um, these students come from all over the world, so they actually travel uh, and, and have on-site session of three weeks at the start and halfway through. Um, we have about 50 to 60 students each year, and we also collaborate with partner sites in Canada, New York, and Singapore. Now, looking at those students, uh, picture here, you can see that this is a very diverse group. They have uh, diverse professional backgrounds. They are physicians, nurses, OTs, physios, dental hygiene uh, teachers, diverse professional backgrounds. Um, they come from all over the world and they range in age from sort of 24 to 60. And when we looked closer at this target group, we also saw that they had very different aims in doing this master's program. It was a, quite a large group of them were teachers who were looking for ways to improve or innovate their own teaching activities. But there was also a group of students who had taken up an education, a leadership role in education or were aspiring a leadership role and who were more aiming to be leaders of change in education, more looking for change management uh, skills as well. And then we have a group of students who want to become educational researchers, who do this master's program because they want to continue into a PhD. So we have different kinds of students with different motivations in this program. Um, and they also live all over the world. So we did want to adhere to student-centered learning, but we also knew that we couldn't do PBL in a traditional way, um, even if only for the, all the time zones that these people live in. There's no way that we can have online synchronous PBL sessions. Uh, and we know that asynchronous PBL doesn't really work. So we had to, move to different formats, trying to adhere to principles of student-centered learning as much as we can. We did that by centering the whole program around authentic learning tasks, um, assignments, if you want. Tasks that are very similar to things that our students could have to do in practice, in their own daily practice. Some of them are group uh, tasks. For example, a group of students get the task to design a course for in an imaginary Suntree University. Or we ask them pre to prepare a special issue of a journal on a certain learning theory. A lot of the learning tasks are also individual learning tasks. Um, and especially then we try to uh, give our students the option to use their own context to analyze the curriculum that they teach in, in their own uh, daily work, or to uh, imagine that they are invited to give a speech on uh, educational vision for the future in their own institution so that they can make apply that to their own context. We use programmatic assessment. Um, for those who are interested, that means that our students get no grades on these uh, assignments or learning tasks that they do. We give them feedback and rubric scores. Um, it all comes together in a competency framework. So there's actually no exam in the whole master's program. There's no grades in the whole program. At the end of the program, uh, the assessment committee evaluates their portfolio to see if they're ready to graduate. 
And if you remember that our student population was so diverse, we, we felt we had to take that into account uh, in two different ways. Uh, so we, we offer a program with a lot of electives, around 60% of the program is electives, which means that students can decide for themselves whether they want to do more work in educational design or in educational leadership or in educational research. Um, it's also flexible in timing because they can balance their own workload. At times that they are very busy, they can take on less learning tasks or less assignments. And in times that they're uh, less busy, they take on more. That's the way that we've tried to make it flexible because we felt that was very important for this target group of students. Um, so there's some obligatory group work where we also on purpose mix groups uh, mix students across sites mix students uh, who have different professional backgrounds live in different countries um, so that they have this op opportunity to learn with and from each other that's the way that we try to still incorporate some of the collaborative learning um, but we can't claim that we do collaborative learning in the same to the I think we may have lost sound. Thanks, Mervyn. Um, I think that it might be the Wi-Fi and the PVT. I'm just in, in phone contact with Carol. I'll check her to um, uh, see if the network has dropped. But while we're waiting for Danielle to come back on, um, yeah. Um, I'm interested to know uh, what you think the call is for uh, the kind of masters that she's describing, where people can choose all kinds of electives from a base master's program. Um, a 60% elective in choice of what your um, okay. Uh, Carol says that they're back. They did have to reboot um no we had to rejoin the session i don't oh, know why, okay. why why we were kicked out okay um, well good I'm <laughs> glad very you're nice of you to explain that and maybe this is a good moment also and to ask if there are any questions up now before i start again um did you see any questions that i could i people have so far no, so far nobody's put anything in the chat, Daniel. Thanks. <laughs> I'm not sure that's a good sign. Um, so, yeah. They're saying yes. They're captivated. Please. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so I think you should be seeing my screen again, right? Um, I'll go into presentation mode. Yeah, we're not quite there yet. Can anybody else see the slides? Yeah, I have on my screen that I'm sharing. Can't see the slides. Yeah, it's not working for us yet. Uh, Maybe okay. try I'll, once more. I'll try again. Not yet. Not yet. So this is really a feature of, I was going to say if it's Wi-Fi, but maybe it's Wi-Fi at the bottom of Africa. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> I'll activity. make another choice and yeah. see if I can do. Or is it the wrong? No, still not. Mm -mm, still not. Carol, I don't know whether maybe you must 
uh, try once more to rejoin. Not sure what the issue is. Yeah, I'll, I'll just go on trying. Okay. Uh, and otherwise, I'll just speak without the slides. Um, It's funny because it says I am sharing on my screen. Yeah, we're not even getting your camera now. Uh, your screen is blank. Okay. Yeah, Carol is starting her computer up as well. It might be something, I don't think I'm on the cable, so that could be a problem. Um, the Wi-Fi might not be working out, but so um, until we get there, it's, our, our, our students indeed can uh, choose learning tasks that fit their interests uh, and choose whether they want to do more uh, tasks around innovating education for themselves or more tasks around leading change or more tasks around educational research. Um, in the end, all of them make a portfolio that shows the same um, uh, competencies. Yeah, I am on the WITS Wi-Fi network. I should be. Um, I can try once again to see share my slides. Maybe it already thought I was sharing my slides. Okay, you're back. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm back. And do you also see my screen now? Or not? We do. Yes, we can Good. see your slides. Then I can uh, then I can start from here. This is this where more or less where we were, is it? Perfect, thanks. No, very good. So we have some uh, obligatory group work in the program uh, where we do mix people uh, as much as we can so that they have this opportunity to learn with and from each other. Uh, but quite a lot of it is also individual assignments because it's just very complicated for people to, to do a lot of group work when they are so dispersed uh, and all work most of them also work clinically so that's sort of the choices that we've had to make um i'll skip some of the technicalities of how it really works also in view of time but what we've seen uh, our first experiences we've been doing this for two years in this way now is that our students really enjoy that they can choose their own focus that they can adapt their own learning path um, they also enjoy that they have the liberty to kind of balance their workload over the year or also to take three or four or five years to complete the program. Um, for us also, we've learned to see that it's not a problem when somebody takes more than two years to complete because they often have very good reasons. Um, so we, we tend to kind of also not see that as a bad sign. We have heard from students that they enjoy uh, the fact that this program has all the electives, gives a lot of freedom, but there's also structure and there are set moments for contact. Uh, they do enjoy the mandatory group work, although it does come with challenges, they tell us, organizational challenges to organize that over different time zones, but also challenges of working in diverse groups, uh, communicate in different ways, work in different ways. Uh, our students also enjoy the fact that, that we use programmatic portfolio-based assessment, but also that comes with some challenges because they, they tell us they have to get used to this idea uh, of not being graded and, and only collecting a portfolio. It's quite uh, nice if you're a coach to see how students also reflect on this process and how their thoughts about it evolve 
between the first and the second year. We also still have challenges. Uh, we have all these learning tasks, but they differ in approach and variation is good, but too much variation is also not good. Uh, we also have some issues around feedback quality. Um, all of our teachers do their best, but not all of our equally useful uh, and high quality feedback. We've made a program that is very flexible, but the downside of that is that it's more difficult to see a longitudinal line or build up or relations between uh, assignments. Uh, and we're also struggling a bit with how much we expect students to reflect and in which way we expect them to reflect. Because reflection is something that can mean something very different for, for different people. Uh, and this is one of the areas that we're doing research on uh, or starting up research on uh, right now. If I look at this program, I, I would think that we do adhere to the principles of constructive learning, that we actually manage to make it more contextual when we allow our students to bring in their own, their own problems their own context, the things maybe they, they have to do anyway for their daily work or things that they struggle with. Um, we, on the collaborative learning, we had to give in. Uh, we can't do as much collaborative learning as maybe we, we theoretically would like. Uh, but on the self-directed learning, we have managed to, to strengthen that aspect if we compare it to a, a more classical previous. PBL approach or that we use um, in the bachelor or master programs on site. Any program, any questions so far? Otherwise, I'll just carry on. I have one more example that is quite extreme. A couple of years ago, we, we organized a, a massive open online course, a MOOC about problem-based learning and we try to do to use problem-based learning in there as well so we based this course around problems problems about pbl we asked the participants to form their own groups um, and and work on these program on these problems for a period of nine weeks uh, but massive open online courses are massive so we did not have the opportunity to give these groups a tutor. So they worked completely on their own initiative without a tutor in their group. And massive means kind of massive. We, in the first run, we, we started with 3,000 uh, participants. About 800 of them uh, really started actively. They, they made groups and about a, a small 300 of them finished looks weird but a completion rate of about 10 percent is quite normal in in the world of MOOCs. This course was also free uh, so we hypothesized that a lot of people just also came in and had a look around and thought mm, that's a lot of work or that's not really what I was looking for and then uh, didn't really engage and that is also not necessarily bad. We looked a bit further and we saw that the people who did engage and, and, and participate actively, they were actually very enthusiastic. So that was nice to know. We looked at the products that they handed in um, and we saw that the quality varied a lot. We had uh, a lot of groups that did sort of okay, um, but what they handed in was more uh, kind of a patchwork of contributions of different people. We also had groups that were better than we had ever expected and more creative and more in depth in their discussion and their products than, than we could have imagined beforehand. So this is really a, a more extreme um, format of online learning where we started with 3,000 people, many of them left for very good reasons, because they weren't just really that interested or because uh, the course was not what they were looking for or because maybe they never really wanted 
to be very active in this course and only wanted to look at the materials. The group of people that, that did participate was enthusiastic, but we also had people um, who would have liked to participate more, but then couldn't find a nice group to be in or um, didn't have the technical skills to participate as much as they wanted. So we had some very uh, positive experiences. We also had uh, challenges. Um, and we think that an important factor is that there was no tutor. If we had a tutor, we could have um, catered for more people. If we do it like this without tutors on a large scale, it's very nice for some people, but we have to accept that there are people that we cannot cater for. So how does this work? To some extent, we, we feel that we're still adhering to similar principles. We made these people work on problems uh, that were constructive and contextual. We stimulated them to work on these problems in groups and to have discussions, but we, we relied far more on their own self-directed learning skills. Conclusions for us as overseeing different ways that we've done online and blended learning. Are you still there? We are indeed, yes. Thank you, because I heard a, I heard a beep and last time that was a sign that I lost connection. Anyway, so what we learned over the years, over the, the different experiences that we've had in sort of the last 15 years, that if you go into online learning or blended learning, the first question you have to ask yourself is why? Why am I doing this? Because if there's a good reason, online and blended learning can work very well. If um, students see that they can save a lot of time on traveling, they're also motivated to participate online. Um, if there's no other way uh, for some of our participants in the MOOC, this was the only way that they could learn in PBL, um, about PBL, then they're motivated and they're willing to be putting in the time and the extra commitment that is needed. If there's no good reason to go to online learning, it often doesn't work because it's just a little bit more work uh, to arrange the technology. It's just a little bit more awkward to talk online. Um, so if there's no good reason, then on-site education often works better. The second lesson that we've drawn is that for online and blended learning, analyzing who you are teaching uh, what the context is, what resources these people have, what needs they have, is even more important than in on-site programs. Because if you don't take into account where they are, or what technology they have available, or uh, what their motivation is to be in your program, um, you're going to design your online learning in a way that doesn't suit, and then it doesn't work. Our third lesson uh, is that if you do online or blended learning, you have to prepare more beforehand because you have less insight in what your students are doing. Um, you have less physical contact and even in synchronous sessions. It's, it's more difficult to get insight in how they really are doing. Uh, and if you meet problems, if you lose the connection, you have to have your alternatives already um, at hand and you have to prepare them beforehand. For me, as an instructional designer, this all comes back to the triangle that I often use. Who am I teaching? what are they supposed to learn and only then I can decide on what how how they can best learn it and how, how I can best arrange it 
and also in online and blended solutions. And that is why I think one size doesn't fit all. So that was my last slide, and I'm I could actually I'm going to stop sharing because then I might be able to see some of you. Any questions, discussion points? I'm trying to look back in the chat as well. Does this in any way, is this similar to, do you do any of likewise things? So I see a question here about, uh, actually I can only see part of the chat. So advice how you design online content. Um, what do you mean with online content? Can I please ask? Um, with the online um, lessons that you've made, um, specifically the MOOCs, um, how do you actually decide or formulate the design for it, if that makes sense? I'm an instructional designer here, so it. Um. <laughs> so. We with the MOOC, we felt because it, it was a, about problem based learning, we, we really couldn't go back to the format that many of these online MOOCs have, right? It would be really strange to have somebody lecture for an hour about problem based learning because it, it doesn't adhere to the principles of problem based learning. So for that MOOC, we decided we wanted to shape it as problem-based learning. So we, we, we wrote problems around problem-based learning. We wrote a problem about uh, to, to stimulate people to discuss what are actually the underlying principles. We wrote a problem around just to stimulate people to think about what is a good PBL problem. Uh, and we tried to adhere to those principles. So we, we gave them a problem, we asked them to make groups, and then we provided them with some mini lectures, with some reading materials, but we also asked them to find their own additional materials. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, or is that it does. Not what you, is that not what you asked? Because I'm not really sure. Oh, no, it really does give the idea, explained um, the format and I'm trying to think about how clinical problems would could also be incorporated into those types of formats. Yes, I, so I think it that in in principle could work the same. Um, the big change here then is whether you have sort of groups that, that you put together or you ask people themselves to make groups uh, and whether you have a tutor then to help them discuss it. And because this was meant to be a MOOC, we, we just couldn't man that many groups. We also didn't have the resources, but we, we tried to mimic. Yeah. I'm trying to see the next question also. Yeah, somebody who says that that some things work in one course and and not in another course, right? Um. Uh, yes, um, I'm also an instructional designer. Uh, when we were building the courses, I noticed that quite a few times, like something will work really well in the one course, and we're like, okay, this works really well. And um, one of the other lecturers will say, okay, I'm going to implement something similar or the same thing, and it doesn't work for their course. So it's yeah. quite interesting to try and find a, pro a solution to fixing that problem, even though you've just done a similar, a similar build. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and when you go and look into that, I think usually there's a reason. Yeah. That it, that it works in one course and not in the other. So it, it starts, if you're an instructional designer, it starts really with that analysis phase where, where you think, who are these students? What are they learning? And, and where are they? What, what resources do they have? Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much. Anything else? Do you do you do similar things in in online education, or do you very different? Do you do very different things? So, Daniel, uh, I would jump in. Uh, I, yes. I do have a question, and then maybe we'll talk about the similarities and differences. The one thing that really interests me is this master's group that you have. So you have sixty students from all over the world. So that's a lot of. Um, uh, cultural differences and geographical differences, and then um, differences in profession. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if you've done any um, sort of overt work in interprofessional education in looking how the groups mediate each other with regard to their professional standings and their um, sort of diverse backgrounds. And, and in their reflections, if you can see that happening. Yeah, so we're just, we haven't done any systematic studies in that yet, but we're, I'm, we've just started up with a, with a Chinese PhD student who's in Maastricht on a scholarship, and he's going to uh, interview students and staff on their experiences and perceptions and trying to make those links and see what what actually influences that. So I don't have any systematic research data. Uh, I we've been doing this for many years, so I have anecdotal experience. Uh, where we see that. Um, well, first of all. All our students are very motivated because they they want to do this master. It's not something they have to do. Uh, so that makes a big difference. Beyond that, there's a whole load of ways that they are. They're, they are diverse in very many different ways. Uh, and interprofessional differences do play a role, but, but on top of that, there's the native English speakers versus the non-native English speakers. There's the age, there's the gender. There are many different factors at play. In there are problems, but but they're not, they don't all, they, they usually have a combination of reasons. And if the, if, the, if the group work is difficult, what students tell us is that it's mostly difficult because of uh, the fact that it's so difficult to organize uh, or because the different expectations uh, and ways to work on something but there's no one-on-one -on -one relation with their professional background or with their cultural background. It's, it's a combination of many, many different things. Yes, I would imagine that, that it is. <laughs> yeah, and I'm actually not sure that that maybe language might be one of the most important ones. Sure, that's a very interesting observation. I think yeah. we have a a microcosmic little um, incubator here in our postgraduate diploma, uh, where we have about um, between 20 and 30 students who work together and have not had exposure of being together in an outside environment. By outside, I mean outside of their clinical work. So they're very used to having a hierarchy in clinical work, and then they come into an education course a health professions education course and, and they have to let that go at the door and, mm -hmm. and that makes it quite hard for them. So, so yeah, that's a conversation I think we can we can pick up. But you were asking if, if people have done similar online courses here and I think there are people in the group who have had experience of 
a blended approach and maybe one of them will just share with us. Do you want me to share an example of what didn't work? Because that might be. Yes, I think they'd love to hear that. <laughs> So a couple of years ago, about five years before COVID, um, I had one of my colleagues in biomedical science was actually doing our own master's program. That, that happens uh, because it, it can be part of their career track. Um, and he was interested to see could he actually save on a physical space in the building by moving half of the tutor groups online. Um, at that moment in time, there was no COVID, there was no lockdown. He he just he didn't have enough rooms uh, to to do these PBL sessions. So he thought he could solve that by moving some of the sessions online. And we had done a little bit of this online PBL, uh, so we knew it could work. But with these bachelor students, it was a disaster. They hated it because they were in Maastricht. They were used to cycling to the university. Masters is a very small town. Uh, it can take you about 15 minutes to cycle to university, but not much more. So they felt it had they had nothing to gain from that, and they may, really missed the social contact as well. So they it just it completely failed. That one completely failed. Yeah, and he stopped doing it. And at what point do you decide that it's failed is the question. Well, it was his master thesis. This uh, experiment, uh, this, this try. So he did, he evaluated his, his sort of half on site, half online PBL. He gave questionnaires to the students who participated and he did a number of focus groups with them and they just told him that it was that, that they hated it. Uh, that they didn't like it, that they really preferred the on 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 site sessions. He also Oh gosh, we're really having network problems this afternoon for me. Danielle is frozen again. Um, can anybody else hear? Um, no, also frozen no. on my yeah. You know, it's really interesting because she was saying that this whole experiment was done pre-COVID. And I'm wondering if the students would have had the same response um, when COVID hit and people had to go online. And then after COVID, when it then becomes a choice of whether we go back to what was done before. Oh, like um, an okay, are, are you back in? So okay. then I'll. Please Sure, can you hear us? Yes, we can hear you, Carol. Yes. Go ahead. Maybe Danielle should turn off her camera and that might save a bit of bandwidth. Um, I would also choose. Leave the camera off on my side. I think the camera is off, I've, uh, but I still, still see myself on the screen, but I don't know why that is. Oh, okay. Um, I'm on, on Carol's computer now, so you can't see me here. <laughs> okay, we can hear you though. But I'm there and I I see a very silly picture of myself on the screen, so that's great. <laughs> Frustrating. So, um, yeah. So the, the question that we spoke about when you froze was um, that he did this work pre-COVID and we were wondering if people have the same approach to um, online when they could be face to face or in person now than, than what they had before. We think maybe the experience of COVID might have um, showed people the opportunities there are in, in distance learning. Um, and, and maybe people would have reacted differently now compared to then. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I have uh, bits bits of knowledge about that, right? So I have um, 
I know that that at the end of COVID in Maastricht, um, our students were very, very glad to be able to go on site again. Um, mostly also because of the social contact. Uh, but as I said, Maastricht is very small and most of our students actually do live in Maastricht. Um, so, so then there's no advantage. I had a, a master's student last year who was teaching in uh, dental hygiene curriculum and they do a flipped classroom model and she did see that after COVID um, her students were less inclined to come to the classroom sessions on site. Uh, so she did her, her research study in there and she found out that, that there's a mixture of reasons. Um, part of it is that more of her students now uh, live at home, live further away from university, uh, and they tend to take a very pragmatic uh, standpoint. They'll only come if they think the session is going to be useful to them. So if if what is if the topics of the of the, the session are too easy or too difficult, or if it's the only session on the day that they have to come for, they're less inclined to come. But she also found that uh, her students had less understanding of the flipped classroom model, uh, that they didn't really understand how it was supposed to, to work, and that a lot of the teachers had in COVID times had glitched to sort of lecturing in the online flipped classroom sessions. So that the students had gotten used to this idea that the teacher was going to explain everything anyway, so why do we have to prepare? So there wasn't really only one single reason. She found that in her case, the students were less inclined to come and less inclined to prepare, but there were a few different reasons for that. Yeah, it's as you say, it's all multifaceted and we can't make assumptions really. It's it's good to actually ask the questions. Yeah, it's good to actually ask the questions and then it's good and that that was her task also after her, her thesis research was to go back to her fellow teachers and discuss uh, why are we doing this flipped classroom model? And if we really want to make it work, we should go back to making those uh, on site sessions useful and valuable to students and we should also change the way that we use those hours because she found she clearly found that that if the students were expecting a valuable session they would come but her students yes. literally said i'm not going because this teacher is only going to uh, recap the things that I, i've already read yes no i agree with you i think i think that students are very strategic in their choices and 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 we fall into traps and then want them to behave differently and we don't give them any reason to yeah sometimes <laughs> sometimes yeah, yeah. <laughs> danielle thank you so much um you've given us a lot to think about and although the group has been quiet this afternoon i can see lots of people with rapt attention so i'm going to ask people if they do still have queries and questions um, to drop Carol an email um, and you've got a couple of days to do it and um, we will get back to you if, if that's the case. But otherwise, I'll wish you a good Tuesday afternoon and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you, Danielle, very much. You shared your wisdom and your humour in the situation of South African Wi-Fi. <laughs> so we're very grateful to you. Thank you.